150. yılı ve Endüstri Mühendisliği bölümünün 40. yılı vesilesiyle düzenlediğimiz programımıza hoş geldiniz. Programa başlamadan önce kısa bir duyurum var. E, programdan sonra yapılacak olan kokteyl bu aşağıda yapılacak diye duyurmuştuk. Kennedy Lodge'da olacak. Çünkü aşağıda 150. yıl sergisi var. Gezmeyenlere de sergimizi gezmeyi tavsiye ediyoruz şimdiden. Şimdi açılış konuşmasını yapmak üzere Endüstri Mühendisliği Bölüm Başkanı Profesör Doktor Ümit Bilge'yi kürsüye davet ediyorum. Sayın rektörlerim, değerli meslektaşlarım, değerli dostlarımız, konuklarımız, sevgili öğrenciler. Boğaziçi Üniversitesi Endüstri Mühendisliği Bölümü adına hepinize üniversitemizin 150. bölümümüzün 40. yıl dönümü dolayısıyla düzenlediğimiz bu etkinliğe hoş geldiniz diyorum. Bizlere katıldığınız için teşekkür ediyorum. Bir bölümün 40. yılını kutlaması e, elbette çok güzel, çok onur verici. Ama bunu 150. yılını kutlayan bir kurumun içinde yapıyor olmak takdir edersiniz ki çok daha önemli, çok daha gurur verici. Bildiğiniz gibi Boğaziçi Üniversitesi'nin kökleri ve geleneği 1863'te Amerika Birleşik Devletleri dışındaki ilk Amerikan Koleji olarak kurulan Robert Koleji'den gelmekte. Geçtiğimiz sene 100. yılını kutladığımız mühendislik fakültemiz 1912'de Robert Koleji içinde kurulmuştu. 1971'e gelindiğinde Robert Kolej Türk hükümetine devredilerek Boğaziçi Üniversitesi'ne dönüştü. Boğaziçi Üniversitesi'nin kimliğini, karakterini belirleyen unsurlar bu köklü geçmişten gelen özgür düşünce, çoğulculuk, bireye odaklılık, demokratik yönetim gibi değerlerin yanı sıra genç ve dinamik bir ruh, sürekli iyileşme prensibi ve araştırmacılık oldu. Bu ruhla Boğaziçi Üniversitesi hızla modern ve çağdaş bir üniversite haline geldi ve günümüze geldiğimizde gururla görüyoruz ki dünyanın ilk 200 üniversitesi içindeki yerini aldı. 70'lerde başlayan bu atılımcı, dışa dönük, arzulu hava içinde Boğaziçi Üniversitesi bazı yeni bölümler kurdu. Bunların ilklerinden biri de 1973-74 öğretim yılında kuruluşu gerçekleşen Endüstri Mühendisliği bölümü oldu. 70'lerin başı aynı zamanda Türkiye'de yöneylem araştırması endüstri mühendisliği mesleğinin başlangıcı sayabileceğimiz yıllar. Çok kısa bir süre içinde hem mesleğimiz hem bölümümüz büyük prestij kazandı. Ve aradan geçen yıllar boyunca da bu prestijli konumlarını sürdürmekteler. Her yıl tutarlı olarak ülkemizin en iyi öğrencilerini alabiliyor olmamız... Mezunlarımızın yurt içinde ve yurt dışında akademi ve iş dünyasında sergiledikleri yüz artıcı kariyerler, başarılı kariyerler bunları göze aldığımızda sanıyorum ki bunu bir başarı öyküsü olarak nitelendirebiliriz. Sağlam bir kurumsal kültür, rekabetçi bir akademik ortam, uluslararası akademik ağda tanınırlık, dünya çapında yüksek standartta bir akademik müfredat, elbette bunlar bu başarıda büyük rol oynuyor. Ama en önemli pay ise bu meslek dalını seçen öğrencilerin kalitesi kadar, yine bu meslek dalını seçen öğretim üyelerinin kalitesinde. Kişisel mesleki yaşamımın Tümünü verdiğim bu bölümün 40. yılında sizlere buradan hitap ediyor olmak benim için tarifi mümkün olmayan bir mutluluk ve onur. Hele ki bölümümüzün kurucu başkanı, bölümümüzün bugüne gelmesinde büyük emekleri olan hocalarımızın karşısında bu benim için apayrı bir heyecan. 
Şimdi sözlerime biraz ara verip bölümümüzün ikinci doktora mezunu eski bölüm başkanlarımızdan Sayın Rektörümüz, sevgili arkadaşım Profesör Doktor Gülay Barbarosoğlu'nu kürsüye davet ediyorum. Değerli konuklar, değerli meslektaşlarım, çok sevgili ve değerli hocalarım, çok sevgili öğrencilerimiz. Bu yıl Endüstri Mühendisi bölümünün 40. yılını kutlamak, hepimizin olduğu gibi beni de çok ayrı heyecanlandırmakta ve gururlandırmakta. Esasen 40 yıl bizim kültürümüzde çok çok uzun bir süreyi ifade eder. 40 yılda bir deriz. Bir kahvenin 40 yıl hatırı var deriz. Kurumlar açısından baktığımız zaman 40 yıl hem çok uzundur hem çok kısadır. Uzundur ve Endüstri Mühendisliği bölümümüz için oldukça uzundur. Çünkü bu 40 yılda bölümümüz 2000 lisans, 488 yüksek lisans ve 46 doktora derecesini vermiştir. Bu çok büyük bir başarıdır. Bu başarı anca uzun bir sürede olmuştur diye düşünürüz. Kısadır çünkü 150 yıllık yüksek öğrenim geleneğini yaşayan bir üniversitede 100. yılını doldurmuş bir mühendislik fakültesinde oldukça genç bir bölümdür. Dolayısıyla kısa zamanda büyük işler yapmış çok önemli bir bölümdür. Bölümümüzle hepimiz gurur duymaktayız. Tabii 1863 yılında kurulmuş Robert Koleji'nin yüksek öğretim geleneğini 1971 yılında miras alan üniversitemiz bugün Türkiye'nin en parlak öğrencileri, dünya kalitesinde öğretim üyeleri, özgürlükçü ve demokratik kültürüyle Türkiye'nin ve dünyanın köklü ve örnek üniversitelerinden biridir. Okulumuz 10 yıllardır toplumdan aldığını misliyle topluma geri vermeyi başarmıştır. Yetiştirdiği bilim insanlarıyla, mühendislerle, yöneticilerle, ekonomiye, iş dünyasına, bilime ve toplum hayatına çok önemli katkıları olmuştur. Dahası bunu yaparken toplumsal anlamda dışlayıcı değil, kapsayıcı olabilmeyi başarmıştır. Farklı inançlarda, farklı sosyal ve kültürel kimliklere sahip gençler okulumuzun çatısı altında hep birlikte yan yana var olabilmişler, okulumuzun eşitlikçi atmosferi içerisinde yetişmişlerdir. Okulumuz 10 yıllardır özgürlükçü ve yenilikçi ideallerle toplumu daha iyiye doğru dönüştürmeyi önemseyen bireyler yetiştirmeyi başarmıştır. İşte bu noktada Endüstri Mühendisliği bölümü de Boğaziçi Üniversitesi'nin bu kültürünün oluşmasında ve kamusal katkısını sağlamada çok önemli ve derin bir rol oynamıştır. Dünyada değişen ekonomiler ve teknolojiler ile yüksek öğrenim modelleri çeşitlenmekte ve küresel yüksek öğrenim bugün hiç olmadığı kadar rekabetçi olmaktadır. Üniversiteler ayrılan fonlarda daralmaların yaşandığı, akademik programların ve bilimsel gündemlerin yeniden değerlendirildiği, uluslararasılaşma çabalarının hem tehdit hem de fırsat olduğu, ülkemizde sadece yüksek öğrenimin değil, genel olarak eğitim sektörünün büyük bir değişim sürecinden geçtiği bu günlerde, Endüstri Mühendisliği bölümümüzün de temsil ettiği tüm değerlere, ve hatta ve hatta Endüstri Mühendisliği mesleğinin katkılarına, devamlılığına, sürekliliğine, itibarına her zamankinden daha fazla katkı sağlaması beklenmektedir, beklenmelidir. Bugün Boğaziçi Üniversitesi'nin rakipleri dünyanın en iyi üniversiteleridir. Boğaziçi Üniversitesi Endüstri Mühendisliği bölümünün rakipleri de dünyadaki en gelişmiş Endüstri Mühendisliği bölümleridir. Ve bölümümüzün bu vizyona, bu altyapıya sahip olduğunu bilmekteyiz ve güvenmekteyiz. 
Eğitim araştırma ve uluslararası açısından üst düzey performans göstererek dünyada ilk 200'e girecek üretkenlikte bir üniversite olmamız küçümsenemeyecek bir başarıdır. Öte yandan tüm teknoloji ve bilim alanlarında radikal teknolojik dönüşümler yaşanırken bu değişim ve gelişmelerin ne kadarının ARGE'ye ve inovasyona dönüşebildiği pek de bilimsel ve inovatif olmayan şekilde tartışılırken, endüstri mühendisliğinin bu inovasyon sürecinde de etkin rol alması beklenmelidir ve rol alacağına inanmaktayım. Böyle özel bir günde sizlerle beraber olmaktan ve Boğaziçi Üniversitesi Rektörü olarak hitap etmekten büyük gurur duyuyorum. Ben hayatımın 39 senesini, 40 senesini bu üniversitede, bu bölümde geçirdim. Öğrendiğim, bildiğim her şeyi Endüstri Mühendisliği bölümünde Boğaziçi'nde öğrendim. Bunu bana sağlayan hocalarımız oldu. Kişisel bir teşekkürle sözlerimi sonlandırmak istiyorum. Kurucu başkanımız Erkut Hocam'dan olmak üzere, Gündüz Bey, Selçuk Erden, İlhan Hocam, Ali Rıza Hocam, Hepinize milletlerimi, şükranlarımı ifade ediyor. Hepinizin tek tek ellerinden öpüyorum. Bütün bölüm hepinizi şükranla hatırlayacaktır. Emekleriniz ve gayretleriniz için teşekkür ediyorum. Ve ben sözlerime son verirken, çok değerli hocam, matematiksel programlama dersi aldığım, dinamik programlama dersi aldığım, bölümümüzün kurucu başkanı Sayın Erkut Ucuoğlu'nun konuşmalarını yapmak üzere ve de bir ufak hediye takdim etmek üzere kürsüye davet ediyorum. Buyurun efendim. Değerli misafirler, değerli hocalarım, mesai arkadaşlarım, değerli öğrenciler, bu benim için müthiş bir onur vesilesi. Düşünebiliyor musunuz? 40 sene önce 26 yaşındaydım döndüğümde. Ben Robert Kolej Yüksek Okulu'ndan mezun oldum. Amerika'ya gittim. Büyük bir telaş içerisinde doktora yaptım. Bu telaşımın sebebini de bugün hala anlamıyorum ama sanki memlekete dönmek için bu telaş içerisindeydim. Zaten bitirdim doktoramı, çalışmaya başladım. Ve o zamanki mühendislik dekanı Vedat Yerliçi beni yaka paça, sen bırak çalışmayı falan gel, üniversitene bir katkın olsun diye beni getirdi. O zaman Boğaziçi Üniversitesi olmuştuk. Ve bu nedenle çok genç bir hoca olarak bölümün kuruluşuyla uğraştım. Diğer bölümlerden yardım aldım. Üniversite Mühendislik Fakültesi Dekanlık ve Yönetim Kurulu ile birlikte çalıştım ve süratle bölüm kuruldu. Fakat ben kendimi adeta talebelikten uzaklaşmamış hissediyordum. 12 saatim kampüste geçiyordu. Hatta hocalar basket takımını ayağa kaldırmıştım. Ve büyük bir keyifle sanki yarı talebe, yarı hoca misali bu kampüste hayatımı devam ettirdim. Tabii benim için en büyük onur vesilesi sevgili Gülay Hanım'ı, rektörümüzü burada görmek. Çünkü o benim hatırladığım, benim bulunduğum dönemde bölümümüzün en başarılı öğrencisiydi. Ve zaten bir yerlere gittiğini hepimiz, bütün hoca arkadaşlar görmekteydik. Dolayısıyla... Bugün beni kürsüye davet etmesi beni hakikaten müthiş onurlandırdı. Ona ayrıca teşekkür ediyorum. Ama bütün diğer hoca arkadaşlarım da burada. Bu departman bir kişiyle olmuyor. Kuruluşu yaptıktan sonra burada Gündüz Hoca, İlhan Hoca, Ali Rıza Hoca, bu hocaların hemen hemen hepsi benim dönemimde beraber yönetimde bulundular ve bölümün kurulmasını ele aldılar. 
Dolayısıyla ben bu onuru onlarla da paylaşmak istiyorum. Onlara da çok teşekkür ediyorum. Ee, bu telaşım hayat boyu devam etti. Ee, hocalıktan ayrılmama neden de bu oldu. Bu telaşla başka işler yapmaya niyetlendim. Ee, bir takım e, enteresan işlerle uğraştım hayatımda. Hem profesyonel olarak hem de kendi işlerimi kurmuş olarak. Ee, ve bu Boğaziçi seneleri benim için unutulmaz hatıralarla dolu. Ee, bir de Stanford'da şunu hatırlıyorum. O dönemde belki bugün kitaplarını okuduğunuz Hillier, Lieberman, Danzig o meşhur hocalar vardı. Ben onlardan ders aldım. Öyle bir heyecan vardı ki o zaman yön eylem araştırması konusunda. Bütün dünyayı optimize etmeye kalkışıyorduk. Fakat sonra hayata başlayınca esas olan optimizasyon değil, temeli anlamak ve metodolojiyi anlamak olduğunu keşfettim. Ee, ve dolayısıyla e, o dönemin romantizminden Türkiye'de yaşamanın realitesini de öğrenmek üzere telaşla yola çıktım ve epey öğrendiğimi zannediyorum. Efendim ben sözlerimi uzatmayacağım. Tekrar bana bu onuru verdiğiniz için çok teşekkür ediyorum. Sayın Rektörüm, değerli hocalarım ve değerli talebe arkadaşlarım. Sağ olun. Artık hem bölümümüz hem de mesleğimiz adına önümüzdeki 40 yıla bakma vakti. Evet, bölümümüzün ilk 40 yılı doğrusu başarılı geçti. Bu övünülecek. Ancak sürdürülmesi için en başta elbette Endüstri Mühendisliği bölümü olarak bizler tarafından ama aynı zamanda tüm paydaşlarımızca sahiplenilmesi gereken bir başarı. Bu sorumluluğun bilincinde olduğumuza inanıyorum. Mesleğimiz açısından bakarsak bildiğiniz gibi endüstri mühendisliği sistemlerin yaşam döngüleri boyunca alınacak kararları mühendislik yaklaşımıyla modelleme ve analiz imkanı, yeteneği sunuyor. Yöntemlerimiz karar hiyerarşisinin görece alt kademelerindeki problemlere uygulanmanın ötesinde üst kademelerdeki yani stratejik, politika analizi türü çok boyutlu, karmaşık problemlere de uygulanabiliyor. Bu esneklik mesleğimizi çağın ve dünyamızın değişen gereksinimlerine göre yenilenebilir nitelik kazandırıyor. Hatta değişimler sırasında mesleğimiz adına yepyeni fırsatların doğması, ortaya yeni uygulama alanlarının, yeni problemlerin çıkması pek olası. Yani mesleğimizin önümüzdeki 40 yılı için ben şahsen çok umutluyum. Ama önümüzdeki 40 yıldan söz edebilmek için isterseniz önce genelde dünyamızın 40 yılına bir bakalım. 2052'de bizlerin nelerin beklediğine dair akıllı tahminleri işitelim. Kendi sürdürülebilirliğimizi planlamadan önce üzerinde yaşadığımız gezegenin sürdürülebilirliğini, bunun koşullarını anlayalım. İşte bu da bizi bu işin üstadına değerli davetlimiz, seçkin konuşmacımız Profesör Doktor Jorgen Renders'e getiriyor. Jorgen Renders, Norwegian Business School'da iklim stratejisi profesörü olarak görev yapmakta ve iklim, enerji, sürdürülebilirlik konularında senaryo analizi, sistem dinamiği yaklaşımlarına dayanan bilimsel çalışmalar yapmaktadır. Norveç'te devlet posta servisi gibi birçok kuruluşun yönetim kurulunda yer almakta olan Jorgen Renders, ayrıca halen The Dow Chemical Company'nin ve yakın tarihe kadar British Telekom'un sürdürülebilirlik konseyinde görev almıştır. Kendisi Norveç hükümetine 2006 yılında sunulan ve gaz salınımlarının 2050 yılına kadar nasıl 3'te 1 oran, 3'te 2 oranında azaltılacağını anlatan raporu hazırlayan Düşük Sera Gazı Salınımları Komisyonu'nun başkanlığını da yapmıştır. 
1981-89 yılları arasında Norwegian Business School'un rektörlüğünü ve 94-99 yılları arasında İsviçre'de World Wide Fund for Nature kuruluşunun başkan yardımcılığını yürütmüştür. 1972 yılında basılan 92 ve 2004 yıllarında devamları çıkan The Limits to Growth, Büyümenin Sınırları kitabı ile birlikte birçok kitabın ve bilimsel makalenin yazarıdır. 30 dile çevrilen ve 30 milyon nüshas satan Büyümenin Sınırları adlı kitabı ile Renders, 21. yüzyılda yaşanacak küresel, küresel krizleri öngörerek dünya çapında gündem yaratmıştı. Renders, Haziran 2012'de 2052 A Global Forecast for the Next 40 Years Gelecek 40 Yıl için Küresel Bir Öngörü isimli yeni kitabını yayınladı. Almanca ve Japonca olarak da yayınlanan bu kitabın halen Çince, Korece ve İtalyanca çevirileri yapılmakta. Dear Professor Renders, It's a great honor and a privilege for us to have you here today with us as our department celebrates its 40th year and looks forward to the next 40 years. We are very enthusiastic about hearing your talk, uh, which I'm sure all of us will find very exciting and inspiring. Now I would like to invite you to the stage, Professor Jorgen Renders. Uh, good evening. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be back in Istanbul. I was here first time 40 years ago, or actually 39 years ago, in 1974, and it has changed a lot. Uh, the main reason for saying something uh, meaningless initially is that you have to get used to my sing song. I speak perfect Norwegian American. So, when you hear anyone with my intonation, it is a Norwegian. Okay, and since you laugh, it means that at least now you understand what I'm saying. Uh, I am a sad man. I have worked for 40 years for sustainable development, and I'm old enough now to know that I have failed. The world is less sustainable today than it was 40 years ago when I started working for sustainability. And the simplest proof of this is of course in the area of climate change, uh, where humanity every year is emitting twice as much CO2 into the atmosphere as is being absorbed by the forests and the oceans of the world. And this other half is of course accumulating in the atmosphere and the concentration in the atmosphere is going up every year and as a consequence the temperature is going up every year and this is going to continue all the time until we stop emitting CO2 into the atmosphere. So we are solidly in unsustainable territory in spite of my hard work over 40 years. So recently uh, I changed strategy. Uh, instead of pleading for policy change, which is what I have been doing all along as a science-based activist, uh, I finally gave up. And I changed strategy into trying to describe what kind of future you are going to decide for yourself. You're not listening to my good advice. Global society is not listening to my good advice. They're still continuing to make decisions, you know, in the old way, largely through democratic decision making and largely through capitalist markets. And so I thought it would be a good idea to try to describe what kind of future this is going to lead to. And that is what I have done. Of course, I do this in the desperate hope 
that by telling you what will actually happen, you will do the unthinkable, namely changing your behavior and start behaving in a more long-term uh, uh, perspective. So that's the agenda. Should we turn this one off? Or do you want it on? Okay, okay. I, I hear an echo. I don't like the echo, but uh, there is nothing to do about this. I'll stand here. Just. 40 years ago, my friends and I wrote, as the chair said, the book The Limits to Growth. Uh, this book contains 12 scenarios for the future. 12 possible futures for the world from the year 1970 to the year 2100. Six of these futures, six of these scenarios, six of these scenarios were sad scenarios where something went wrong in the 21st century. Either resources ran out or there was too little food or there was too much pollution. Six of the scenarios in the Limits to Growth were positive scenarios where humanity managed to achieve some kind of sustainable development uh, during this uh, century. And the important point of the 1972 analysis was that at the time one did not know enough in order to be able to tell which of these 12 futures was the most likely one. So all we could say you know, was that humanity ought to work for the positive scenarios. They ought to work for sustainable development, but we couldn't say much about what was likely to happen. Since then, we have learned a lot. Uh, and we have actually, you know, we have learned a lot about the world. We have learned a very uh, big amount about how decisions are being made in the world. At the individual level, at the corporate level, at the national level, at the global level. Uh, and we know, in my mind, so much that it is now possible, as I've already said, you know, to make a forecast. It is possible to tell what will actually happen in the future. One cannot tell what will happen on a 130-year horizon, but one can say, I think, what will happen over the next 30 to 40 years. That's the, within the time it will take for democracy and capitalism to be changed, if ever. You know. So one can forecast for as long as one is convinced that the current decision-making system will continue to operate. And this is what I have done. And this forecast is described in the book called 2052, which is, uh, to be more precise, it's already out in six languages, and it is now pushing 100,000 copies. So it's starting to, to have an impact. The importance of this slide is that it states the name of the book website, www.2052.info, where all the tens of thousands of numbers and historical data and the uh, spreadsheet models and the whole thing is available and set up in such a way that you can just go in and make your own forecast if you want to or look at mine. If you choose to make your own forecast, that's a waste of time, because my forecast is, of course, much better than yours. <laughs> and and it, I've spent much more time on this than you will ever spend on this. And so, of course, my result is much better. So that's for the advertising. Good book. Uh, when I was making this forecast of the world, I started by splitting the world in five regions. Uh, so I used the United States as one region, China as the second reason, region, the rest of the industrial world, the rest of the rich world as the third group. Then there is a group called Bryce, which is Brazil, Russia, India, South Africa, and the 10 other emerging economies with more than 100 million people. So these are the 14 biggies, you know, that are not in the other categories. And the final category, the rest of the world, are the remaining 140 countries of the world, which are largely small, 
and largely true. And so what I do, I make an independent forecast for each of those five regions and I add them up and that is the world forecast. And since I have not been allowed to speak for more than five hours, I will only talk about the global forecast. If you're interested in the regional forecast, read the book or, or go to the website. Uh, so, let us, so what I'll do, I'll just summarize some of the main elements of the global forecast and then make some comments afterwards. And then in the question and answer period, you may ask all the questions, what does this mean to Turkey or for Turkey? So, first, the global population. The global population will peak in 2040 at 8 billion people and the global population will be in decline in 2050. This is, of course, much lower than the population numbers that you know, because you know that there will be 10 billion people in the 2050s and going up. The reason why you know this is that you put a lot of emphasis on the UN medium population forecast, which is well known and used by many of the institution, international institutions of the world. There exists also the UN low forecast and the UN high forecast, which no one talks about. And mine is very close to the UN low forecast. Why will there be so few people in the world? This is because the women of the world will choose to have much fewer babies in the next 40 years than they've had over the last 40 years. The fertility, the, the total fertility, the number of children per woman on average has fallen from four and a half children per woman in 1970 to two and a half children per woman in 2010. And my forecast that is that it's going down to one and a half uh, uh, children per woman in 2050. In the rich world, this will happen because women will choose to have a job rather than having more children. And in the poor world, where most of the women now live in urban slums, they, you know, they will choose to have fewer children because it is terribly expensive to have kids in the slum. It made a lot of sense to have many children when you lived in the village. It does not make a lot of sense to have children when you live in the slum. Of course, education, health, contraception, all help in this direction. But the main driver of this development is female decisions in the rich and the poor world. And of course, I love this development. I think this is highly advantageous, you know, to get the world population to a peak and then starting to decline. Uh, on the, ex the second central element, if you want to make a forecast of the world, is of course the level of economic activity. You know, what's the productive uh, capacity of the system? What's the annual output of goods and services? And uh, the red line here shows the world gross domestic product. That means the annual production of goods and services. Uh, on average, uh, yeah. Over the last 40 years, the world economy has grown by 3.5% a, a year. The red line, so it means that since I started talking about these things in 1970, the world economy has become four times bigger than it was at the time, the red line. If the world were to return to the historical growth rates, and grow for the same 3.5% a year for the next 40 years, the world economy would become four times as big as it is today, using four times as much resources, four times as much energy, four times as much food, etc. Luckily, it will not. The world economy will only be roughly twice as big in 2050 as it is today. And why is this? Well, you must see annual production as the multiplication of the workforce, you know, the number of hands, and the productivity, you know, the output per person per year. And you know already from my first slide that the workforce is going to peak and then start to decline. So the important question, what will happen to productivity? What will happen to the output per person a year? And my point illustrated here is that the growth rate in productivity has been declining steadily over the last 
40 years and will continue to decline and get to very much close to zero within 50 years and at that point in time the economy will no longer grow, it will actually go down because the, the workforce is going down. What is the, and why will productivity growth not continue? Let me explain. And this will be particularly in the mature world, much less so in, in the poor world. And the reason is that in the rich world, you know, you started with an economy where most of the people work in agriculture. Then you add tractors and energy, and you move people into manufacturing. Then you add more machines and more capital, and you can move the people into simple office work. Then you add the computers, and you can move people into services. And then you can move into entertainment, and into you know, the health sector, and into social services, and into care. And what a mature economy is, what the US is, is that society which has moved essentially all its people into this business. And this business is largely, uh, so the, the, the challenge in this part of the world over the next 40 years is to increase the productivity of the women that are going to care for me in the nursery home in another five years time. You know, so increasing productivity in a mature economy is much, much, much more difficult than increasing productivity in a young economy. You know, where industrialization of manufacturing processes is a simple thing due to uh, industrial engineers, you know, who know how to do these things. Your task in the future is to try to do something, as I said, you know, with all the women, men and women who work out here, and that's much, much harder to do. The United States of America already has 14% of its labor force in health. And so even with 14% of the people trying to keep the other Americans slim, you know, it doesn't work. And so, you know, they need much more people in here in order to try to maintain the health of the Americans. So this is the underlying reason why the world economy is not going to grow as fast in the, in the future as it has grown in the past. The mature economies, Europe and the United States, will remain essentially flat. They are already at the peak. Then, of course, several uh, economies are going to follow the model of Japan that, you know, caught up from the 1950s to 1990, then South Korea did the same thing, picking up, and now China is one third through the same catching up process. So yes, a number of poor countries are going to grow much faster. And then uh, the sum of this is my red line, and my estimate is that the world economy will only be roughly twice as big in 2050 as it is uh, uh, today. Sorry for the lengthy explanation, but this is an important point and very badly understood. And then there is a third point, and then the heavy going is over, so we can start, you know, amuse ourselves. Uh, because there is a third thing which will happen over the next 40 years, which is important. And that is that global society is faced with a number of complicated issues like depletion of easily available resources, pollution problems, climate challenge, climate damage, the need to adapt, unequal distribution in the rich world, etc. Problems which we typically postpone, but then we will have to solve them over the next 40 years. The simplest analogy is America. Uh, I use America as the example since I love that country, I'm educated there, I live there for a very long period of time, and so I feel entitled to criticize Americans, although I'm a Norwegian. Uh, you know, Americans are stupid enough not to be willing to spend money now to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But when the hurricanes hit New Orleans or New Jersey, they have to repair the damage. And that's exactly what this picture is all about. In the future, a certain, you know, historically, we have been consuming 75% of the GDP and invested 25% of the GDP. In the future, we will be forced to use much more of the capital and labor of the Western economies and the world economy on uh, 
pollu fighting pollution, fighting depletion, fighting climate change, fighting uh, adaptation. This is another simple example. The Dutch will have to spend manpower lifting the dikes, you know, when the sea level rises. So that's what this is all about. So I've told you the three important things to learn from an intellectual point of view. You need to think about the fact that the world population will hit. You need to understand that economic growth over the next 40 years, particularly in the rich world, will be very anemic. Uh, and then you should understand that sooner or later, the sins of the fathers are actually going to catch up with us. So we have to spend resources in order to solve the resulting problems. These are the three fundamental things in my forecast. Let me be much quicker on some of the consequences, because once you have these bases, it is, for instance, very simple to forecast how much energy the world is going to use in the future. Um, uh, we know that the energy efficiency has increased over the last 40 years. The amount of energy used per unit of production has gone down the green line by roughly 1% a year. And there is all reason to believe that increased energy efficiency will also be a characteristic of the future. It's possible in principle, and it is economically interesting, and consequently it will be done. And then once I know the energy efficiency, the technological advance, it's, I just multiply with the, my GDP forecast and I get the energy use. And you see the energy use of the world will actually peak in 2040. And after 2040, we will be using less energy every year you know, than we did in the past. It is, if you go into the detail, you can look at the composition of this energy, uh, so how much is coal, how much is oil, how much is gas, what is nuclear energy. Basically, you see from this graph that the fossil uh, components increase for a decade or two, and then they start to decline. The reason for that decline is not that the world is running out of coal, oil, and gas. It is because of the yellow line, which is all the renewable energy. This is the hydro, the wind, the sun, the biomass. You know, that is coming in, gradually squeezing the fossil fuels, fuels out of, uh, of the, the energy mix. The simplest proof of that statement is that if you integrate, if you look at the sum of fossil energy that will be used over the next 40 years in my forecast, and compare it with the amount of energy reserved that are already entered into the books you know, of the energy firms of the world, I only use one half of what is currently booked as it serves in the energy companies of the world. So looking for more energy at this point in time is totally ridiculous. Half of what we have already entered as it serves will not be produced until after 2050. Useful if you are placing money somewhere. Uh, once I know this picture, it is trivial to calculate how much CO2 will be emitted over the next uh, 40 years. You just multiply the energy with and you get the CO2. And you see that the world will not do what the world has solemnly promised to do, namely to cut CO2 emissions by 50 to 80 percent by 2050. Uh, my forecast is that you are going to cut zero. Global society, the only difference in, in is that in 2010, emissions are growing at 3% a year. In 2050, they will be at the same level, but declining at 3% a year. And they will not be declining because the negotiators in Warsaw plus 25 or Warsaw plus 50, you know, uh, reach suddenly an agreement. It will be declining because the GDP is no longer growing very fast. Energy efficiency is increasing all the time, and renewables are entering the scene at a decent rate. And that's the reason why the CO2 is finally being phased out of uh, uh, my forecast. And then finally, the final curve. Uh, sorry, once I know the CO2, it is of course easy to calculate how warm it is going to get. So you just use one of the climate models, you enter my the CO2 emissions curve, and you see the temperature, which is the red line, 
we are now at plus 0.7 degrees relative to pre-industrial times. In 2050, we will be at plus 2 degrees centigrade going up. And that's, as, as some of you know, plus 2 degrees centigrade is, of course, the danger threshold. This is what global society has agreed that we should stay below. We will not stay below. We will actually move through at very brisk pace in 2050. And then I show a final a graph just in order to illustrate that there are many dimensions to, to my forecast. So many people are worried about food, you know, can the world produce enough food to feed itself over the next 40 years? The answer is yes, easily. We can, we, all we, since I know how many people there will be and I know how rich they will be, I also know how much food they will demand and they will demand roughly 70% more food than they do today. Can the world produce 70% more food than it does today on a sustainable basis? The answer is absolutely yes. The world can probably produce three times as much food as it does today on a sustainable basis. Then you can ask, why is there starvation? And that's the pedagogic point here. People starve now, they starved 40 years ago, and they will starve 40 years in the future for the same reason, which is lack of income. The reason why people starve is not that the world system cannot produce enough food. The world starves because the African, this hungry African, does not have sufficient income to be able to pay an Ukrainian farmer to actually increase the productivity in Ukraine and then send the resulting food to Africa. So starvation is an income distribution problem. It has nothing to do with the physical constraints of the world system to produce food. This is important to remember if you are among those people who are worried. So there will be enough food for everyone who would like to buy food in 2050 and there will still be 2 billion starving people namely those that don't have the income to buy the food that they need in order to survive. And that's exactly the same situation that exists today and exactly the situation that existed when I started talking about this 40 years ago, when people at the time also thought that the world could not produce more than the three uh, gigatons of food per year. We are now, as you see, at least at two and a half times that level you know, at that time I said that the potential was 10 times what we produced in 1970. That's why I say that we're still three times more is, is doable in the future. Now I will stop. This is uh, all we need. Uh, let me move to a somewhat more interesting discussion of, of uh, uh, the elements here. Uh, so what I'm saying is that uh, the first point is that the world population and the world GDP will slow by themselves, not because of planetary constraints. And the population will slow down, not because people die or because of pestilence, but because women choose to have fewer children. And the economy is going to stagnate not because people have come to their senses and understand that limited consumption is better than endless consumption, but because the economists and the politicians and the business people of the world will discover that although they try all the time, they don't manage to increase the GDP per person in the rich world. You have already seen symptoms of this over the last decade in Europe. You know, where the long trend is flat and it goes up for a few years, down for a few years, up for a few years. This is going to continue for another 40 years. That's, of course, not a very pleasant outlook, but it's easier to know. The second point I'm making, that although things are going to slow down, it will not slow down fast enough to avoid a climate problem. So the emissions of CO2 during this gradual slowing down will be big enough to push the world above the 2 uh, degree centigrade and actually move it close to the 3 degrees centigrade, which may be uh, a difficult 
thing because it may melt the, uh, the permafrost. Science does not know whether this is a, a serious problem uh, or not. The third point is good news. You know, since there will not be 10 billion middle class people in 2050, which is the basis for most of those resource analyses that you have read, those that conclude that there is not enough energy or not enough water or not enough uh, phosphates or not enough lithium for the electric batteries of the cars, they all assume that the world will have grown economically and population-wise over the next 40 years, so that there is 10 billion middle-class people. In my book, there are 6 billion. It's roughly one half the demand. And if you enter my demand side into the analysis that you believe in, you get my result. There is more than enough of everything. So that's the good news. But notice, again, there is a difference between the need and the uh, the, the demand or the use of, of something. So, yes, there will be poor people. Because, that's the fourth point, when the world economy is only one half of what it would otherwise have been, there is, of course, very much more poverty, particularly in the poor world, but also you know, in the rich world in this scenario, uh, because of skewed income distribution in, in, in the rich uh, world. Sorry, I want to do this. Uh, then, of course, all of you are asking the main question. How can this arrogant bastard from Norway be so sure that he is so right? You know, how is this possible? You know, he is only 68 years old, so he has only lived here for a short while. How can he know? And the reason why he can know is the following. This is the cheapest solution. The 20, 2052 forecast represents what happens if whenever there is a choice, you know, someone chooses the most profitable solution or the cost-effective solution or the solution which is the cheapest solution. So this is the sum total when everyone goes after the easy buck or the fastest income growth or the fastest profitability. So, uh, and I, since I do think that people are going to continue you know, at the individual level, at the corporate level, at the national level, and at the global level to go for the maximum profit, you know, this is what we will get. Some people, you know, hope that the market will solve the problem. They believe that capitalism is actually going to solve this problem. They are wrong. Capitalism is made in order to allocate capital to the most profitable project. And that's exactly what we don't need at this point in time. We need to allocate capital to more expensive solutions than the cheapest one. We need to use the capital to build windmills, although windmills are twice as expensive as coal-fired utilities, etc. So we need to use the capital to build electric cars, although the electric cars are more expensive than the fossil cars. We need to build houses that are slightly smaller, but with thick walls, you know, so that they don't need a lot of air conditioning, which is more expensive than building them with thin walls, which is what we're doing. So capitalism is not going to solve the problem. The market is not going to solve the problem. Then some people hope for democracy, for parliament, because the parliament at least could legislate in such a manner that you uh, uh, create alignment between the corporate interest and the profit interest and the societal interest. And I say, good luck. You know, this is what we have been trying for the last 20 years in the simplest of all simple cases, namely introducing a price on carbon, you know, a price on climate emissions. It has taken us 20 years to get to the current situation where we have a fledgling quota system in Europe with a price which is you know, one-tenth of the price that we need in order to have any meaningful impact. Whenever there is a politician who has a wise proposal, the voter very quickly understands that this means either higher taxes or more expensive gasoline 
or more expensive power. And of course, they very quickly get rid of those politicians. So the short-term nature of the individual ensures that we have short-term politicians, which makes it impossible to change the frame conditions around capitalist society. And that's where we are. And since none of this is going to change during your lifetime, yeah, that's the reason why the 2052 forecast is rock solid. <laughs> I have now given you the, the main thing. I'll do two entertaining things just to show that this can be used for a number of amusing things. First of all, I have now spoken only about the average. Let me show you how one very important variable differs from region to region. So this is now a plot uh, of the after-tax income, the disposable income, basically, uh, of persons in the five different regions that I treat. And let me, let me take them from the top down. The top one is the United States of America. It's the most productive economy on the surface of the Earth. In other words, with the highest uh, disposable income in the world. It doubled during the last 40 years, and my forecast is that it's going to go down by 15% roughly over the next 40 years. So, in other words, I think what we will see is that those poor blue-collar workers in Detroit, whose income has not increased since 1980, you know, the hourly wage, even the annual wage of a blue-collar worker, hasn't you know, increased since we left you know, the United States uh, 30 years ago. I think this is going to continue, so the children of, of the current generation of blue collar workers will be even worse off you know, in 2050 than they are today. How is this possible? Well, it is possible because, first of all, the United States is the most mature economy on the surface of the Earth, which means that they have most of their workforce out here in the soft hopeless bomb you know, of, of, of social work and care. So they are trying to pioneer productivity increase in that quaternary economy, you know, post-tertiary uh, type of economy. Very difficult. The second reason why they will not do well, they owe the Chinese a lot of money. The Americans owe the Chinese roughly one-third of an annual GDP. This needs to be repaid. How do you repay this? You have to produce something that the Chinese is actually interested in buying. This will require a restructuring of the China, uh, American economy, which requires the third thing that the United States do not have, and that's a functional government. So you need you know, someone who can make decisions at a sufficient speed that you can actually do the restructure. And America cannot even do this for simple matters. And in the future, they will have to do this in complex matters, which entails redistribution of income and wealth in, within the United States. This is the only way to get the US out of what it is. They will not do this. And as a consequence, they will slide gradually backwards, you know, uh, down from the peak, which is essentially now. The green line is Europe, uh, and uh, it is essentially the same as the United States, but with slightly better uh, future. First of all, Europe is poorer than the United States, so we can still learn in productivity terms by copying the Americans a little bit. Secondly, we don't owe uh, the Chinese a lot of money. You know, luckily, the debt in, in, in Europe is within Europe, so that's not a net drain. And then thirdly, although some of you may not like Brussels, Brussels is much better than Washington. Brussels every now and then makes enlightened policy, you know, which is way ahead of the people, you know, like the 2020 legislation in the climate and energy field, which of course never would have passed through a short-term parliament, but was put in place by the meritocracy in, in Brussels. Of course, people are working very hard in, in order to you know, get democratic control over the commission, so this is only a window where, where Brussels is capable of doing better things, but it is a window, and it will last for a while. The winner is the red line. That's China. 
So the average Chinese will be five times as rich in 2050 as he or she is at this point in time. You may ask the question, how is this possible? Uh, well, it is possible because of the perfect alignment of the interest of the Communist Party of China and that of the vast majority of Chinese. Both of those two groups want to get rich as fast as possible. And since it is possible to get rich as fast as possible, and the Communist Party needs this in order to stay in power, and the, uh, the Chinese wants this because they're the most uh, materialistic culture that exists on the surface of the earth and has been like this for 2,000 years or 3,000 years, this is going to work. Some people ask the question, but what about that's 3% of the Chinese population who would like to speak their mind rather than getting as rich as fast as possible. And my view, having no follow of China for the last 40 years, is that the 97% are certainly going to be able to control that tiny minority who thinks it's more important to speak than to get rich. And so my forecast for China is a solidly optimistic one from the point of view of the Chinese people and the Communist Party. The line will, of course, not be as smooth and elegant as it is on this graph, you know. It will be like this. Now they will need to solve the pollution problems and the corruption problem and the inequity problem, but these things can be solved. And as long as you have a government which is capable of making decisions just the way it should be done, this is going to solve itself. The, uh, the Burgundy line are the 14 big uh, emerging economies. This is the Indonesia's, India's, uh, Brazil's. Uh, I don't think Turkey is in that category, but because of the population being less than the 100 million uh, threshold. Here I ha don't have very much to add. I just guess that one half of them are probably going to do it. And all, that means copying China, which is copying South Korea, which is copying Japan. Uh, the other half will not manage. And whether India is in the category that will make it or not make it, I no, don't know. Whether Indonesia is in that group or not, I don't know. Vietnam, I think they are probably going to do uh, the, the China trick. You know? So you have to, mm, one has to know more about these nations than I do in order to be able to say something. Yellow line is the rest of the world. Those are 140 poor uh, countries. Uh, and there I make the following assumption. They have managed to grow at roughly 2% a year over the last 40 years. Uh, and since nothing has changed over the last 40 years, I think that that's going to continue. So they will grow at 2% a year over the next 40 years. They have moved from $1 a day in 1970 to $2 a day now. And so they will be at $4 a day in, in 2050. Again, to make life simpler for you. Some of you have a spouse at home who will ask, what the hell did he say? You know, and then you should use this slide. So what did he say? And I'll read it to you so that you can be absolutely sure that you are able to answer. He said that the world population and economy will grow more slowly towards 2052 than most people expect, but still fast enough to trigger a climate crisis. And then he said that consumption will stagnate because world society will have to spend ever more on repair and adaptation. And then he said that the short-term nature of man, reflected in the short-term focus of democracy and capitalism, is the root cause of this development. He did not say that we need dictators, but he implied that. <laughs> In the old days, I always stopped here. And then, of course, people would say, but please, Mr. Anders, tell us what to do. And I said, that's a waste of time. Because I can tell you, but you are not going to do it. Because it is more costly than doing nothing. And they said, please, please, Mr. Anders. <laughs> and so I've now given up. You know, I just tell you this first. But please don't waste my time by telling me that this will not be done. It will not be done. I solidly <laughs> agree with you. But here is the solution. So there, there are six things that global society ought to do. 
Point number one is to further slow population growth. And then it is, of course, in particularly in the rich world where we need to get rid of the babies. My daughter of 30 <coughs> consumes roughly the 30 to 50 times the amount of an Indian girl. It is Norwegian babies, which is the real problem. It is not Indian babies. So first in the rich world, they reintroduce the one-child family. Secondly, cut CO2 emissions. We know it's not very difficult to solve the climate problem. It's just to ban the use of oil, coal, and gas. And first in the rich world, you know, I give it as, as a 10-year delay. You know, so we do this by 2024. We already know the technologies. We know the substitute. We know everything. Yes, it is more costly than not doing anything. But the amount of increased cost, as I said, is of the order of one to two percent uh, of the few, uh, of the. Uh, so I skipped that. Sorry. Okay, uh, my mistake. Uh, I forgot the chapter. So after I gave you the conclusion, you know what you should tell when you were most depressed. I should have said. It is important to stress that a much better future is actually possible. This should have been the introduction to this graph. Uh, uh, it is technically possible to solve uh, the problem. And all we need to do in order to do this, and this is according to the other studies that you have read, the UNEP study, the Stern report, if we only move 2% of the labor force and 2% of the capital in the world, and particularly in the rich world, from the dirty sectors to clean sectors. That solves the problem. And this is calculated many times over, so we know that the number is 2%. It is not 1, and it is not 4. It is 2. And all it means is to take those people that currently make fossil cars, force them to make electric cars. Take those people that currently put in gas utilities, make them put in windmills and solar panels. Take those people that currently build houses, big houses with thin walls, make them make smaller houses with thicker walls. It's a small shift. That, that's all it takes to solve the whole problem. And this actually also solves all the other environmental problems in the same goal. But it doesn't cost zero. You know, it's cheap. But 2% is more than zero. And you know as well as I do, when a society gets the chance to choose between a bill of zero and a bill of two, they choose the bill of zero. And consequently, we will not implement the solution, although it is very smart to do so from a moral point of view, because you will then be solving problems for future generations. Then. I would have normally stopped. Then you would have asked me, please tell me, Mr. Anders, what to do. And here is what you should do. You should first of all push your government to introduce the one-child family as quickly as possible, and particularly in the rich world. And I, my part of the job is to press my government to do the same thing, because of course Norwegian government is as stupid as yours. You know, try, we are trying to pay women in our country to have more babies, just like you are trying to. And we pay them much, much more than you do. And we have 20 years experience in this, and we know that it doesn't work. That's the interesting thing. So we have, of course, been paying women to have more children for 20 years, and we're still only at 1.8 children. So this is, it doesn't work. And it's a wrong policy, because it is really sacrificing future generations on the uh, you know, in order to get some happiness now or, or, or some more workforce. Then it was the banning of the coal, oil, and gas, which is fully doable. It is more expensive than doing nothing, but it's fully doable. The third thing we should be doing, I mean, some of you pretend that you're worried about poor people in the third world. Well, the simplest thing you could do for those people is to use all the development day that we're currently using to build a low carbon energy system in the poor world and just give it to them. Most of poverty alleviation is to get energy to the people. It's not money or democracy or human rights. It is actually to get electricity you know, to the, the village. So we should be building the windmills and the solar panels and the hydro plant and just give it away. The fourth thing one should be trying to do is to reduce 
the ecological footprint of people like myself. You know, the, the middle class and the upper classes of, of the world. And the, in, the only fundamental solution here is to legislate compulsory vacation. So you actually deliberately start reducing productivity growth in the rich world by forcing people not to work. You know, and this is the only thing I've been able to think about in 40 years. We will actually draw down production growth and then gradually, of course, then reduce consumption growth and the ecological footprint. Don't tell me that this never will be introduced. You know, I solidly agree, but this is the solution. Fifthly, you know, you should try to do something about the short-term nature of the human being, the corporation and the nation-state. And as far as I can understand, the only thing you can do is to try to introduce a supranational institution which says, Turkey, you do like this. US, you do like this. Sweden, you do like this. Norway, you do like this. And of course, all the Norwegians are going to object. And that's the end of the story. But this is uh, the solution. Uh, and it is interesting to see that democracy has been smart enough, in some cases, to voluntarily introduce a super democratic institution, particularly in the central bank area, in the monetary policy area. One has been smart enough to understand that it is not a good idea to have a vote on the 30th of each month in the parliament where you decide how much money to print next year, next month. You know, it's better to leave this to some experts. So, you know, every now and then, society makes a smart move, and here they could do others. And then finally, since I'm at it, particularly in the, in the rich world, since incomes are not going to grow anyway over the next 40 years, Perhaps this is the time to change the societal goal from being increased income to being increased well-being, subject to the constraints that incomes will be constant and the population will be declining. So you have to start thinking about how to make people more happy without more money and while the population is going down. And I can tell you I have a long list of things you can do, which can be done inside this. Then the end. Uh, the, it all basically boils down to trying to convince people to be willing to make a sacrifice today in order to get an uncertain benefit for the children or the grandchildren 30 to 60 years into the future. That's the real leadership challenge and I don't think that is going to be solved. It is, of course, very easily said, you know, and the purpose of giving a talk like this is, of course, to make some of you so irritated at my arrogant style and my message that you actually decide to do something about it and in this way make my forecast wrong. Thank you. And now I am more than interested in getting comments, questions, answers. I'll try to handle them, and, uh, uh, and if not, uh, Jan will help me. <laughs> yes, please. I just put that. Can you hear me? No. You should turn it on for the audience. The question is, what is your underlying assumptions about the way technology and innovation will move during this period, which I assume has to be in the foundations of your forecasts? So the, so the question was, you know, what, what, uh, what are my assumptions concerning technological development. And the very short answer is that I assume it will continue more or less at traditional rates because I assume that society will continue to invest a certain amount in R&D and, and pilots over this period. 
So that's the, at the high level of aggregation. Uh, but I'm always reminding people that innovation does not come by itself. It's nothing that just comes out of the blue. It comes because society is willing to use a percent or two of its total productive capacity to pay for scientists and labs, you know, in order to do things. Or in the private sector, do the same type of thing. So you see, and then, that's my underlying assumption. The green line shows in the concrete case of energy use per unit of GDP, how, what is my quantitative assumption. And then you also have the similar thing uh, in the climate intensity. This is how much CO2 we are going to emit per unit of energy in the future. So they're both going down more or less at the historical rate. Concerning agricultural productivity, I assume more or less the same, that through the use of GMOs, you know, largely, which I don't like, you know, we are going to be able to continue to increase the agricultural yield, you know, and then when the climate change starts uh, hitting uh, uh, the fan, which is uh, up here to the right, uh, uh, we will adapt to this by changing the diet. So, you know, uh, what CO2 does to agriculture, you might be interested in knowing, is two things. First, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere increases. This fertilizes all plants, so they actually grow faster because the CO2 concentration is higher. The negative effect is a secondary effect that comes from the heat. So when the CO2 concentration goes up, the heat goes up. And in my country, this is great, you know, so Norwegian agriculture and forestry is going to have wonderful times over the next 70 to 80 years. Uh, whereas in South India and in other dry areas, you know, this is going to be a problem, the, the heat. But of course the farmers are not stupid, and so they will of course adapt, change the, the, the, the stuff they uh, plant. Uh, so there will be adaptation, and that's also technologically uh, advanced. So I think uh, these are the major technologies. Yeah, I think that's the. the, the so I'm a, I'm a physicist of training, and of course I am. So I'm a typically technologically optimist, like everyone else, except that I'm a little smarter than most technologists, because, or most innovation people, because most innovation people seem to believe that innovations come by themselves. I see them as the result of hard work and funding. Yes. Here comes. Yes. Obviously, it's a brilliant talk. I really appreciate it. I love it. So I have two minor questions. One is personal, well, you were perhaps. No. Sorry. No, no, I wasn't. Oh. I go, I, so, so you uh, are speaking English. Prefer? Thank you. Uh, what was it? Huh? I hope you. <laughs> no, no. I hope you won't take the first one as the personal question. Oh, please do. I'm curious. Well, yeah. that will be second one. Yeah. I'm really curious. If you have ever, if you ever spoken to little kids, I mean school children or poor people, it seems like your audience are the policy makers, decision makers, you know, big guys. And the reason for my question is, uh, I am also interested in your other kind of presumptions. That is, human model, the implicit human model you have behind or beyond. This is very. It, it is working, but. Speak uh, slowly, and uh, it's, it's okay. easier, yeah? yeah? This is what I'm trying to do. Obviously, you are very aware of the... No, you turn it off. The age of modernity, you know, it's really marked by also disciplinarity. Just like you have your roof class, some of their, uh, you know, neighbors in your faculty or maybe in other places also have their own podcasts about, let's say, collective uh, reflectivity. Do you think nothing will change, in other words, in terms of this environment and consciousness or appreciation of the invisible, uh, abstract? Because, you know, with uh, all the other available data we have, Humanity's uh, okay. mental I, age, so to speak, for my words, is very slow in infancy. 
as they say, it's a concrete operation there. <laughs> That's my first question. Okay. The second one, or maybe they said, they, I should stop here and you'll respond to this okay. one. Okay, good. Okay. Please. Yeah. Uh, so, in my language, you are asking about what is the chance of value change. You know, where human beings suddenly change their basic appreciation of the world and start to become more long-term than they were in the past. When I was 40 years younger, in the early 1970s, I certainly believed in this and I set out to get this to happen. Uh, I am now 40 years older and I have absolutely no belief in, in, in the fact that we will see any type of meaningful change in the time horizon that human beings use in their decision making. I apologize for this fact and I hope that it does not keep you from working your ass off, you know, in order to, to make this happen. But I don't think it will happen. Remember, my question was if you have experience, if you ever thought about changing your target group, your audience. Remember, I started talking what, what, about the uh, school kids, elementary kids, could anyone these, or uh, cool people, rather than so, the policy makers. Are you, ask, are you asking whether I have ever spoken to ordinary people? Kids, kids. Kids? Yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, of course, many my, minor changes. No, I, uh, this, this, I'm not challenging you. I'm, I'm sincerely no, no. interested yes. in your own so, so, so why don't you ask me first how many children I have? You know? Well, I was thinking of asking you about your wife's okay. situation. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. So the point is, yes, of course, I have spoken to children, and yes, of course, I speak and spoken to poor people and to ordinary people. I was speaking to more people than you will ever speak to during your life, uh, and uh, uh, the, the conc and of course my own children. You know, this is uh, so. I think I can report back to you that my way of talking to them or with them has not helped. That's the, yeah. yes, you do that afterwards. Wonderful, I'm sorry. Over there somewhere. Uh, I have watched the 40th year symposium for limits to growth by uh, via live broadcast from the web and I have uh, listened both to your and uh, Dennis Meadows uh, views. Uh, then your book has, has not been published, uh, and I wonder uh, what uh, does uh, the co-author of Mr. Grove, your colleague Dennis Meadows, think about this uh, forecast? Because uh, he seemed to have a slightly a different, maybe more pessimistic uh, view than yourselves. Uh, Good, good question. So there were four authors of the Limits to Growth book in 1972, and we also wrote the 20-year follow-up and the 30-year follow-up. And uh, uh, together, no one of them is dead, and one person is no longer participating in the public debate, so it's only Dennis and I who are left. Uh, Dennis's views are now so pessimistic that he did not want to participate in writing a 40-year book because he basically says that global society will crash you know, within the next 40 years. Uh, and he has then theories about how this will happen. My view is different. I think that the, we, humanity is not going to solve the problems through active decision making, but luckily the problems emerge so slowly and since so many people will remain poor and consequently not have a footprint, the total burden on hum of humanity on the planet will be not critical over the next 40 years. If you ask me for the next 80 years, you know, once the temperature has gone up to plus three degrees centigrade, where it levels off in my analysis, I am I'm open, I don't know yet. Science does not know whether plus three degrees centigrade actually starts melting the permafrost 
in a self-reinforcing manner, which will then lift the temperature to plus six or plus nine degrees, which clearly would end civilization as we know it. Or whether we're very lucky, and that only one half of the permafrost or one quarter of the permafrost melts, which will make life unpleasant, but not catastrophic. So I am much more optimistic than he is. He thinks that, you know, whereas I think what will ha happen to Bangladesh is that when the sea level goes up 30 centimeters, you know, by 2052, the Bangladeshi will move in north in Bangladesh. The Indians have already built the fence, you know, to keep the Bangladeshis out of India. So it's going to look very ugly in, in, in Bangladesh. But this will not start a world war. So they'll just kill each other in, in, in there. And we will live happily in Norway with our rapidly growing trees and our rapidly growing food. So my forecast is one where we don't get the global collapse. His argument then is that this is first of all an amoral point of view that Jorgen holds. I disagree with that. I'm trying to describe what you are going to decide, you know, and create, so I don't see that as amoral. Then he secondly says that these things that are going to collapse is like in the financial crisis, when what was lost was confidence, some immaterial substance that maintains trade and maintains ownership so that I can invest my pension money in Japan. I basically say that, yes, I agree, that confidence may well decline, and trade may decline. This doesn't matter at all. You know, if the repurchasing power in Norway fell by 50%, what matters? Nothing. You know, some capitalists will of course lose a lot of money, and some of the pension funds will lose a lot of money. But for us it would mean basically going back to the situation in 1970, and we lived in 1970, you'd have a much lower productivity level. And so, these are the types of discussions that go on between the real pessimists who think that something will happen soon that actually is going to dramatically change uh, life and people like me who basically say that we are certainly not going to solve the problem the way we could have done but the muddling through scenario is only stupid it is not Catastrophic. So I hope this was a, that if Dennis was here, that he would have agreed that this is. Finally, let me. So when he gets angry at me, he says the following thing. He says that Jorgen, you are stupid. I mean, first of all, you were my student. You know, I remember I am your professor and you're the student. Uh, then, which is true, uh, and you're much younger than I am, three years. So. Then, then he says, your views are just like a small kid who takes a watch and removes 1% of the pieces of the watch and then you assume that the clock will only go 1% slower. <laughs> That's his, that is his pet argument, which is an interesting argument. And, you know, uh, I, I, I admit that if the world is like a clock, you know, then doing some damage to it might make it stop completely. But I don't think that's a good analogy. But he thinks. Yes? Um, so I, I would like to pick up on this, this discussion because obviously what you have kind of shown us are, are arguably very macroscopic indicators, you know, for the population, for production, and you know, as we know, like averages and other things, they are reasonably robust. Uh, but there is, of course, a, a underlying microscopic kind of dynamic. I'm a physicist, so I tend to sort of see, uh, you know, this is part of our bread and butter. I'm not claiming that this can be applied to uh, what, what you're doing, but obviously there is a microscopic kind of, you know, our individual actions, things that are happening. There's, you know, there's the climate is changing. We, we are having change in behavior. And so I, I have to probably agree in the critique that just even if sort of things seem to be sort of changing smoothly, uh, the dynamics that gives rise to it on the micros microscopic level, A, it doesn't have to be smooth. Uh, B, if it's not smooth, there's, some, there's other things. Even, uh, I mean, we, we know about, so maybe 
it's, it's the details that matter in the end. Uh, and, you know, it is, so maybe, yes, you might be right in terms of, you know, this curve will be followed. You might be wrong, the, the curve might not be followed because from a certain point onwards, the, di the microscopic rules have changed so much that you trigger, you know, what could be considered as a catastrophe in a, for example, mathematical sense. We have systems where you can kind of smoothly vary a parameter and suddenly the system at a certain threshold jumps from a state A to a state B. And I mean, of course, these are, I mean, this is a horribly, uh, you know, complicated system, our world, but I mean, uh, maybe couldn't you be accused of being a little bit optimistic in your assumptions? I mean, even if one would agree that, you know, we follow these curves more or less very, very roughly, nicely, I mean, the impact of how we follow these could turn out very, very tragic, you know, etc. Good. So, I get, I get your point. And, and the, the, so the question was, couldn't something happen at a slow, somewhat more detailed level that kicks the macro development off its track? The way I'm handling this in the book, there's a whole chapter on what is called, in my profession, wild cards. You know, these are things that could happen, and then I'm trying to think through what would be the consequences. So obvious things are a split on China. You know, that the China don't manage to keep it 1.3 billion people together. So some of the uh, mayors of the big southern provinces basically put a barbed wire between them and the rest of China. You know, what would happen? So I do things like this. And, and to answer the one about China, each of the pieces, if you split China into four pieces, each piece is still bigger than the United States of America, population-wise. So it means that true endogenous economic growth in even each of those blocks, you can reach higher productivity levels than the United States ever did during its time. So it doesn't, from that point of view, it doesn't matter. What it would mean would be that the four sub-nations of China would be moving at different speeds, but they would all continue in the same direction. And, and uh, so then I've been going through all these ideas that, uh, that uh, people have suggested to me. The only thing that actually works that would matter is a revolution in the United States of America. If the US underclass and middle class finally got their act together and understood that me and my friends, the elite in the United States, has been screwing this country for the last 40 years and finally introduced classical politics in the United States of America, you know, basically taking from the rich and redistributing to the poor so that the poor could start demanding food and bricks and TVs so that industry in the United States could start producing with its ridiculously cheap labor, you know, things for the other poor people in, in the United States. Then you could get, you know, a couple of doublings of the, the GDP in the United States of America. What's the chance that you get a revolution in the United States? in my mind, for historical reasons. And you can just interview any cab driver when you land in the United States and ask him, you know, why don't you unionize? You know, that's an interesting question. They always complain about the low tax rates and the fact that someone else takes all the profit. And I say, why the hell don't you unionize? You know, gang together. And then, of course, they, they turn around and say, you must be a communist. And of course, that's absolutely true on, on that score. So, revolution in the United States is the only thing I've been able to think of that actually would matter. And this will not happen. So, think about the other one. Okay, that's good. I like that smile of yours. This is <laughs> Who knows? I agree with you. Who knows? Oh, there. Oh, there is one here. Huh? Good. Um, Ms. Fenders, you said that the resources uh, will be enough to cover demand. Uh, our data, especially uh, environmentalists, have the uh, idea that resources, especially water, won't be enough in like 50 years because of the climate change, other environmental problems. So uh, I have my doubts on that. How did you decide that it will be enough? 
So I, I have all. So the question is, how can I be so sure that there will be enough resources to fuel the world economy over the next 40 years? And there are two answers that I like because they're simple and they are for us physicists, you know, they're down to the real basics. The first one I've already given you. All analysis that you have read assume that there will be 10 billion middle class people in 2050. They assume that you know, population development will continue. They assume that we will succeed in you know, growing the world economy again after the financial crisis. There will not be. As I said, in my forecast, there are only 8 billion people and 2 billion of those are very poor. They're so poor that their footprint is low, so there's only 6 billion people of any consumption level. And you do the math and you see that the demand that they are going to put on the system, and that is after the technological development, which is going to continue until then, is low enough that it, there is no problem. And I showed you that it quantitatively in the energy field, where the energy that we will use over the next 40 years is one half of what is already in the books of the energy companies. It's not you know, things that we think we will find that we know is there. It's already found and with certain sufficient credibility that the accountants, the, sorry, the auditors, have allowed them to put it into the books, which is then establishing the value of those energy firms. So in the energy area, I know that I'm right. And then you can say that, and here comes my second answer. If you have enough energy, no resource is scarce to take your water case. You know, it is fully possible, if you have not enough energy, to desalinate water. And then you would say, well, this is expensive. Well, it isn't that expensive. I mean, so you can easily do it if, if you're willing to, do, to increase the cost of the food by 10%. You can easily you know, do, use desalinated water. Then, of course, it simply then shifts the problem from lack of water to production of CO2 you know, in the energy field. So, so that's the problem. So these are the, I think total demand will be much lower. I think that technological advance is going to continue. And I think we, I know we will have enough energy. And consequently, we will use energy as a substitute for most things. Also, you must think about recycling. You know, in an economy which is growing, recycled material cannot ever, you know, really fill 100% of the need. But at once when you go over the peak, and you start to decline the population and stabilize the economy. You know, recycling rates very quickly go get up to close to 100%, so that the need for virgin material declines dramatically. And even stupid society today is smart enough not to start producing the lithium batteries for the electric cars without thinking about the recycling of that lithium. So, the, the, this is how I think about this. And the more I hear myself speak, the more convinced I am that I am right. <laughs> so take someone far back, you know. Yeah. yeah. That gun. Uh, thank you for the speech. Uh, my question is about, you were talking, you were saying that there were some problems with the viewpoint, viewpoint of capitalism uh, in your forecast. Uh, we, we face problems, we face decision problems, and the viewpoint of capitalism causes more problems. Uh, have, uh, throughout your life, have you witnessed any other system that at least proposes some solutions or solution-like viewpoints to these problems? <laughs> It's a good question. So the question was, uh, since I'm so skeptic about the short-term nature of democracy and capitalism, do I know any other system of governance that solves this problem? And the answer is essentially no, except not, nothing that is predictable. But you have seen in your country uh, the solution that I believe in, and that is Atatürk. 
So you had a strong man who decided to build the country, you know, in one way. And that is the way I think, I think the Chinese management is currently trying to build China. And this is certainly the way my country was built by 200 gentlemen from 1945 to 1965. So there was the guy who was the head of the big Labour Party who ganged together with the Ministry of Finance and then they started, you know, basically building the country. Disregarding the fact that people wanted to import ladies' dresses and oranges and cars from abroad, they basically took all the foreign exchange that Norway could uh, generate and used it to build the country rather than importing consumption goods. And of course people were furious but since they did exactly what the, what the Chinese are now managing to do, they managed to increase purchasing power sufficiently that people remember that they actually was slightly better off this year than two years before. You know, they, they lived with this and they only threw out this government after 20 years. So, so, uh, so it's this type of, you need the benevolent uh, oligopoly, you know, the, so a, a group of people who then thinks it's an interesting and entertaining to build the nation. And, and uh, the Prime Minister in Singapore, who of course runs Singapore as his uh, fiefdom and has successfully, you know, lifted this from scratch to a high level, he uses one of the other techniques which I think is important. He pays the guys in the top part of the system so well that they are very expensive to bribe. So that you're basically taking care of the reasonable economic interests of the people who run the country and then you try to find people who know that they're rich enough to survive the rest of their era and then they have as a new task, you know, to build the nation. Which is, of course, great fun. I mean, can you imagine being Minister of Finance in China? It must be great fun. Or Chi or Li or any of these people, you know, seeing if you could actually do what all the analysts in the rest of the world, all the conservative, all the market oriented people say they will not succeed. You know, imagine how fun it will be when they succeed. And they can do like this. Which, interesting case. So it's only 18 months ago that the unanimous Western press, the business press that I read, you know, was absolutely certain that power could not shift from the former president to the new president and prime minister in China. They were all in agreement that something would go wrong in this process. And of course nothing did go wrong. We now have a new strong president in place and he has been able to fight you know, down uh, the opposition to such an extent that he can now move meaningfully you know, in a direction which builds a strong China. So this is the type of, of and, and then finally what I said, central banks, I think this idea of moving important and complicated decisions out of the public arena and into an expert group is probably something we ought to do with every now and then when we have difficult decisions. Like pension systems, you know, when people get older and older, pension systems in the West were made for a totally different situation. Everyone understands that you need to do something with the pension system. And of course, everyone understands that if you ask for a vote, you know, you'll only get idiotic answers, you know, which says me first, or at least everyone else's pension should be reduced, but not mine. And so the only way to handle this is to have a commission that you know, finds it interesting to try to come up with a solution and then a decision body that is capable of deciding on such things. Okay, so long question, no, long, long answer, but very difficult question. Of course, I have a question with it. Yes. Very short answer. Uh, you stabilized the world population at about 8 billion. Yes. But one of the reasons for that was the increase in death rate. Why do you expect the death rate to increase? <laughs> so the question was, on my first slide, you saw the world population peaking at 8 billion, then going down. You saw the birth rates going down. 
but then if you noticed, the death rate was going up. And this is there because I always try to test the audience, whether there is some really quantitatively oriented <laughs> and observing person in the audience. Good. Uh, so if I now send the answer back again, I'll, I'll show you to you since we... Oh, on the wrong direction. No, no, no, no, no, come, come. So, I, uh, so that everyone sees. So, here is the slide. Then, the first thing you should do, so this thing uh, says how many percent of the population that dies every year. You know, so it's the, it's the right hand scale, it's the percent per year. The reason why it goes up is that the number of all people in the population increases when it starts to go down. So, in this end, you have many young and few old. In this end, you have few young and many old. And since you measure the number of deaths as a percent of the total population, it increases. The longevity of people, you know, the life expectancy, increases from, from uh, of the order of 70 years here to 85 here. So I assume that modern medicine is going to spread throughout the world because uh, it is very cheap. So that's actually going to happen. But well spotted. You know, it, it, one point two. Final question? Okay, here. The International Energy Agency has revised all its projections uh, as a result of the shale oil and shale gas uh, boom of reserves. So I wonder uh, if your uh, figure would have been affected by this as well. Uh, my first question. And the second one is on nuclear power, nuclear energy, because you have a quite conservative uh, figure here. Uh, if you go for the ban uh, coal, oil, and, and gas scenario, do you see nuclear uh, as a possible a way to uh, fight against climate change. So, my energy forecast is here, and if you want it for each of the regions, you know, read the book or, or have a look. Uh, the important thinking here is the following, <coughs> that renewable energy is the ultimate solution. I, in the year 2100, I will be very, very surprised if the fossil age has not ended. You know, clearly the fossil age is a two to three hundred year period, uh, and but because of the negative side effects of using coal, oil, and gas, and the fact that there exist substitutes, we will, you know, end. So it's basically a question, when does the fossil uh, era end? And in my book, it will end determined by the speed at which wind, solar, and etc. enters into the picture. So I have made guessworks on how fast does the price of sun comes down, how fast will the price of wind comes down, how, what will happen to biomass, what will happen to hydro, etc. And the sum is my yellow curve, which then determines how much needs to be filled, fulfilled with, with uh, fossils. And then you see, then I, I'm thinking a little bit about the mix between the oil and the coal and the gas, and you see, I assume that the oil thing will stay more or less flat. This flat thing is a rapidly declining amount of conventional oil, an increasing amount of unconventional oil, the dirty stuff, or the stuff from Uzbekistan, or the stuff from the deep Norwegian continental shelf, or the Brazilian stuff. This is expensive stuff, but it will still be there. Then you see gas is going to expand very rapidly from now over the next 20 years. First of all, because the gas is there. Secondly, because it is, after all, better than coal from a climate point of view. So, although the world, if the world was only maximizing short-term profit, they would, of course, go solely for coal, but they do not. I mean, there is some rationale even in the human population. So, this means the gas is growing fairly fast. 
and then uh, they go up and then gradually they get squeezed out by renewables. Then the, the final question is what about the nuclear energy? And basically what I think is that we will have nuclear energy uh, in the world, but only at roughly current levels or a little less. And most of the reactors will have moved from the west to Southeast Asia. And so there are only a few Western countries that will continue to run uh, reactors, uh, France, uh, Finland, you know, and then most of the, I, I think the Americans, because of shale gas, you know, they will not build a single new nuclear reactor. It's much cheaper to build a shale gas based utility than it is to build a, a nuclear reactor. So I don't think there will be any nuclear energy in the United States in 2050. And then, uh, but there will be a lot in China, in, in uh, Vietnam, in, in Pakistan, India, etc. But not a real lot, only 300 reactors, something like this. Why? Because people don't trust nuclear energy. They are wrong. I mean, nuclear energy is the safest you know, energy source. The number of deaths per terawatt hour of atomic energy is lower than coal or whatever. So the public perception is wrong. But the public's perception cannot be changed. This is what democracy is all about. And so they are going to keep uh, nuclear energy out of most of the countries. Yes. Jorian, you have this rosy future for China. Yes. And you have these, your ideal uh, Bullets ideal uh, decisions or policies slide. How many of those do you think, if you compare the two slides, how many of those ideal policies is China implementing or you believe will be implementing in the future? If you compare the, you take your ideal policy slides. So, so the question is, how many of these policies will my pet government of China implement? Uh, and I think the answer is uh, fairly simple. They, the first one, even then, you know, understood that this was important in 1981, when they introduced uh, the one-child family policy. And this has been wildly successful from my point of view. There are no 400 million fewer Chinese than it would have been if they had allowed people to have as many children as they wanted to. Uh, so this has worked very well. Uh, uh, when you talk to the Chinese at this point in time, you know, they are a little worried or sad that this was not introduced a little earlier because as you know they're currently now buying land in Africa in order to be able to feed you know the Chinese population during this decade and the next which is in their view policy failure you know they haven't been able to draw down the population fast enough then most of you probably at this point in time are aware of the fact that they relinquished the one-child family two weeks ago in the third uh, plenary. And in my uh, mind, this they did in order to please you, you know, the Western audience. In China, this has been discussed for many years already. Uh, and already several years ago, they did soften the one-child family in the sense that in the villages, if you were a mother who was a single child and a father who was a single child, then you were allowed to have two children in the villages. And so what they have done now is basically to increase this policy to also include the cities. And they do this because they know it matters absolutely nothing. You know, what determines the number of babies in the city in China is the, de is the decision by an educated woman who is married to an educated man in a structure where the cost of living and the cost of education is sky high and where everyone really wants their child to be the most important animal on the surface of the earth. And so the willingness to have children in China is exceedingly low and all Chinese you talk to, young and old, 
argue that this is not going to have any effect. The professional view is that the, in Shanghai, the, the average number of children per woman is 0 0.6. That's the average over the last decade. They think that with changing the legislation, it will grow to 0 0.7. That's what the demographers think. So why do they do this thing? I think they are smart enough. They understand that the journalists in the West, you know, who only write about unimportant things, you know, they are very hung up on the one-child family, and so here they do this, which does have no impact on population growth in China, but it buys them 15 points with the journalists. This is my slightly arrogant attitude, but, but I think there is a lot of truth. If this had mattered, they would never, ever have taken away the cornerstone. This is the most important thing, because their wish is to create heaven and earth for Chinese in China. You know, the Chinese don't want to live in Turkey, you know, or, or in Norway, or in the United States of America. You know, this, this is the Middle Kingdom. You know, they have 2,000 years of tradition. They want to live in China. And China is limited compared to the 1.3 billion people there. So this is, that's the first one. The second one, they are moving ahead very briskly. You know, much faster than the Americans and the negotiators are willing to credit them for. Uh, and of course, the total collapse in some solar prices uh, the other year was, of course, because the Chinese really start to produce solar energy, although it's much more expensive. Uh, giving, giving away energy systems, I don't, they don't do this yet, but they certainly do build all the roads and all the factories and all the stuff, you know, all over the world. So their development aid volume is huge, you know, at an early point in time. The vacation thing they haven't gotten, they are not that rich yet, so they still need, you know, to work. Uh, supranational institutions, they don't like them. You know, so they, here they are just like Americans and others. They want to decide for themselves. And then increase in well-being, and that will be my final story, because that's the end. So I work, uh, so the, the Chinese decided uh, five years ago that they needed sustainable development indicators. You know, just like Turkey probably has, Norway has, the United States has. You know, these are not GDP per person, but measuring pollution levels and, and uh, other things. And so, interestingly, they, they got in contact with a Norwegian research institute, and the 300 men in Beijing that were asked to do this thing, you know, started a collaboration with the Norwegians, and luckily I was involved in this. And so we managed to convince the Chinese to make a set of sustainable development indicators that make sense. And that means not the way economists normally do these things, but where we started saying that what you need to measure is unsustainability. So you need to measure the income differential between the rich and the poor, the income differential between the urban area and the land area, the level of corruption, you know, how many times a year are you being subject to. So you measure the pollution level, so you measure all the unsustainabilities rather than doing best practice in the West, which is to try to measure the degree of sustainability, rather measure the problems so that you get a clear signal back to management, what is the problem, and then you do something about it. So we managed to get through this one. So they have now a wonderful system where they're measuring everything that goes wrong. So they know exactly how, how fast it goes wrong. What does this have to do with well-being? Well, we also managed to convince them that instead of only measuring GDP per person as the success measure, we convinced them they should measure in parallel well-being. You know, so you go and ask the Chinese, you know, how happy are you? On a scale from zero to ten, how happy are you? But then we consulted with happiness research over the last 50 years, which of course teaches you that if you ask this question in a rich country, there is no change. You know, so the GDP doubles and happiness is exactly the same for decade after decade. So that doesn't work as for policy guidance. 
So what you need to do is what we have convinced them to do. So you ask persons, you know, on a scale from 0 to 10, how happy are you? And then you ask, how does this compare with five years ago? And how, does, how do you think it will be in five years in the future? So we start finding out how big a fraction of the population thinks that things are better today than five years ago and believe that things will be better five years in the future. So you, have, you get the fraction of the population that says better, better. And then if we start measuring this every year over time, you will start to see whether policy is actually increasing the fraction of the population that thinks that progress, you know, increase in well-being is the same as progress. So this is subjectively reported perception of advance in well-being. Fabulously interesting. Then we had 200 or 300 interviews were out, made 30,000 interviews in China, you know, a questionnaire about unsustainability and these things. And so we can now answer the question, how many percent of the Chinese answers better, better. You know, that things are better today than five years ago, and better will be even better five years in the future. 75% of a representative sample of Chinese says better, better. You could do this in Turkey and try to find out how many says better, better here. I did it in Norway, so I paid the Gallup institution in Norway before I was going to a meeting in China to find out what is the situation in my country, which is really rich and where real income is growing at 3% a year and has done so for the last 15 years. And in Norway, only 25% answers better, better. Another 25% says same, same, and a few says worse, worse. So this is, you know, starting to measure perceived progress in the population, subjectively reported perceived progress, and start to use this as a guide in policy making along with the GDP per person is an important thing. And we have been able to convince the Chinese to do this. Let's see if they follow up, but at least we have done it once. And so the important thing is now, of course, to repeat every year. With those words, thank you very much for... <laughs> a little bit, as it should be, I guess. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, invite here Professor Yaman Barlas as well to present you this uh, little reminder of, I don't know, today and World University and our anniversary. So, thank you. Again, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, and thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Good.